done, we had talked about how people uh, run for Congress, some of the informal requirements, committees, and so on. Again, we're going to break down passage of legislation, debating, um, and some of the issues that we see in um, Congress. All right, so how does legislation get passed? A bill can originate in the House or the Senate, keeping in mind that only the House can introduce a revenue bill. So the budget can't originate in the Senate, it has to come from the House. So in that area, the House has control over budget bills. Otherwise, someone in the House or the Senate can introduce a bill. Whatever chamber is introduced in, it then goes to the committee in the House or the Senate be deliberated. And within that committee, they'll send it to a subcommittee. So a small group of people will hold hearings, listen to expert testimony, and amend the legislation before sending it back to the full committee. And so it goes through the committee markup where I can rewrite the bill, include some of the changes that were proposed at the hearings, maybe changes to language, proposed amendments, and so on. They can also choose to hold their own hearings if they want. There's over 10,000 bills that get introduced every congressional session. 80 to 90 percent of them die in committee. Sometimes it's seen as redundant, not a priority, too expensive. So there's a variety of reasons why most legislation never makes it out of the committee. If the committee decides that the bill should be discussed, then it's up to the committee to decide if it's an open or closed debate. In an open rule debate, members of the House or the Senate can debate the legislation and add amendments. In a closed debate, um, only a few people are allowed to speak on the bill or propose amendments. Most of the time, the committee is going to prefer a closed rule discussion because they don't want 10 or 15 amendments added to the bill and potentially changing its structure. Um, so most of the time, they'd rather have the closed rule versus the open rule. Again, most legislation dies in committee. Um, a lot of legislation just doesn't make it through. So they do weed out the legislation that they don't think is important or relevant or maybe too expensive. is a debate on legislation. The power of recognition really comes into play here. This is where the Speaker of the House and the President pro tempore and the Senate will decide who gets to speak on a bill. In the House, the Rules Committee gives most of the time to the bill's sponsor and to the bill's leading opponent. So it's up to the leadership to decide who gets to speak on a bill. And this is really important because they get to control who speaks for it and who speaks against it. So if someone really feels strongly about this piece of legislation, they have to convince the leadership to allow them to be the person who speaks. 
Um, not everyone gets to speak on a bill, otherwise they'd never finish debating it. So it's pretty strictly controlled. They'll put in time limits like two minutes, five minutes, something like that. The Senate has a special power that's called the filibuster. If a senator has a very strong objection to a bill, he or she can take to the floor of the Senate and block the bill from coming to a vote. They don't have to discuss the bill. They can talk about anything they want. The rules are they cannot sit down, they cannot go to the bathroom, they can drink water, but all they can eat is hard candy. And basically, you can filibuster for as long as you can stand up. The longest on record was in 1957, when Strom Thurmond filibustered on the floor of the Senate for 24 hours and 18 minutes, which meant he never left the floor of the Senate. He didn't really get much of a chance to sit down or take a break. But you have to want it, because they don't make it easy for you to filibuster. But again, you can talk about whatever you want. Um, you can read a book. You can just talk about whatever. Uh, I like to joke that if I was a senator, I'd bring my copy of The Stand by Stephen King. It's 1,400 pages. I could be up there for a while. But you have to want it. Because again, you can't sit down and you can't go to the bathroom. You better be prepared. Um, you better be wearing adult diapers. Um, and you better be able to keep standing. The minute you sit down, it's the minute it's over. Now, if the filibuster is going on too long or the Senate just isn't in the mood for it, the 60 senators vote to end the filibuster, it's over. Um, so if someone tries to filibuster, but 60 senators say, no, you don't, that's the end of the filibuster. If they don't, then that filibuster goes on and on and on. So again, you really have to want it. Um, and you really have to have the strength to keep going. There's also um, the process of adding amendments to a bill. All amendments have to be voted on before you can vote on the final bill. Um, and it can only stop the process of adding amendments by a unanimous vote. So this is where people will add some of the pork barrel legislation, where they'll attach an amendment for $2 million for a park in their district, or $2 billion for a bridge in the middle of nowhere in Alaska. And all of those have to be voted on before you can vote on the overall bill. So they have to be approved or denied. The Senate also has the ability to place a hold on a bill. If a senator opposes a bill but doesn't want to be on record as doing so because it might be an unpopular decision, they can put an anonymous hold for up to six days. After six days, if they're still blocking the legislation, they have to identify themselves in the congressional record and state why they oppose the bill. They can only be anonymous for six days. After that, they have to say who they are, and then they become um, pressurized by interest groups, fellow members of the Senate, uh, their constituents, and so on. It's temporary. They can't block it anonymously indefinitely. They have to go on record as to why they oppose this bill. Technically, as far as I know, no. But the problem with that would be if you did your five hours and you left the floor, 
they could rush and hold the vote before the next person could get up and speak. Um, so usually there's only one person who will get up before the next vote. And technically, you could probably try to do that, but the minute that person sits down is the minute the leadership moves it to a vote. So it's possible, it's just not likely. Yeah. But what party members can do is, let's say I'm filibustering and I've been up there for like seven hours, and you can tell I need a break. You're allowed to ask me a question during the filibuster. So I could sit down for a few minutes, you could ask your question, and then I could go back to filibustering. Members of the same party will do that to give them a little bit of a break. Um, otherwise, you're just up there and, you know, you just got to keep going. Um, I know Senator Cruz filibustered by reading the cat in the hat or the cat in the hat or green eggs and ham, one or the other. Green eggs and ham, okay, that's what I thought. I wasn't quite sure. Um, yeah, they'll do kind of funky stuff like that. It's just, I'm opposed to this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what you talk about, it just matters if you keep talking. Like I said, I bring a Stephen King novel and I just be like, all right, let's keep going. Okay. So once they're done voting on all of the amendments, once they've had all of the debate and all of the discussion, you have to hold a vote on the bill in both chambers. Usually the leadership will not allow for a vote to be held unless they know the bill is going to pass. Nancy Pelosi is not going to allow a bill on the floor of the House unless she knows it's going to get through, because otherwise they look weak and ineffective. Um, if she can't get her party to vote on a bill, she's in trouble. But of course, the differences between House bills and Senate bills are going to be pretty significant. This is where you get that conference committee that has to iron out the differences, um, who has to put together one single bill that will be voted on, um, where they remove repetitive information, include the amendment, and basically just make it so it's one single bill. Once they're done revising the bill, and introducing it, then it has to be voted on. It only takes a simple majority to pass um, legislation. So the House has to vote on it, the Senate has to vote on it, and of course it has to get through both chambers to go to the President. If it passes through Congress, the bill is then sent to the President can either sign it into law or he can veto it. And with the veto, the president has two options. One, return the bill to the Senate or the House unsigned within 10 days of its passage. Or, if Congress is an adjournment, for example, for the Christmas holiday, um, the president can just leave it on his desk for 10 days after that, it's considered veto. A pocket veto is going to be used if the president doesn't necessarily want to send a strong message. He wants to take a more passive form of action. Now, Congress can override a presidential veto, but it takes a two thirds majority in the House and a two thirds majority in the Senate. So it's rare. It can happen, it's just rare. A recent example, though, was in 2016, Congress introduced a bill that would allow the families of 9-11 victims to sue the government of Saudi Arabia for their alleged involvement in 9-11, because 15 of the 19 hijackers came from Saudi Arabia. So it passed pretty easily with um, high bipartisan support. President Obama vetoed the bill, Congress overrode the veto. Here's why the president vetoed the bill. What the people in the House and the Senate didn't 
realizes that it has a reciprocity clause. We could sue foreign governments, but in turn, foreign citizens could sue us. So victims of drone strikes in Afghanistan can now sue the United States government, which is why President Obama vetoed the legislation. The members of Congress didn't seem to realize that. Um, it's kind of hard to vote against a 9-11 bill, right? How do you vote against something like that? Because they didn't fully understand what it meant, they chose to override the veto. So, yes, families of 9-11 victims can try to sue Saudi Arabia. The families of U.S. actions abroad can sue the U.S. government in exchange. So. So obviously Congress doesn't work in a vacuum, right? They don't lock themselves away from the world and work on legislation. There's going to be all sorts of factors that have an impact on how they choose to vote. Part of it is us. If we tell our member of Congress, you vote yes on this or you're out of a job, then they're going to feel pressure to vote a certain way. I know we'll hold them accountable no more likely to vote the way we want them to. There's also the role of interest groups. Um, the NRA will use a scorecard with letters A to F. A being someone who's seen as fully supportive of the Second Amendment, F as someone completely hostile to the Second Amendment. They'll give each member of Congress a letter grade. Um, and sometimes, a failing grade actually works for a member of Congress. After the shooting in Parkland, Florida, uh, the congresswoman for that district, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, was cleaning up the fact that the NRA gave her a failing score. She's like, look at what I'm trying to do to protect her kids. Look at how much the NRA opposes me. Um, so sometimes Congress can use that to their advantage. We'll also get ratings from the AFL-CIO um, in terms of how much they support unions. The National Right to Life Foundation, um, seeing uh, members of Congress as pro-life or pro-choice. This can put some pressure on members of Congress uh, to vote a certain way, but they can also use it to play up um, their policies with people who are opposed to these groups. Party identity also comes into play. Uh, members tend to vote with the party over 90% of the time. They don't want to take off the leadership. You don't want Nancy Pelosi endorsing an opponent in your primary in the next election. You don't want your party um, giving you the cold shoulder and not supporting your agenda anymore. Within Congress, they have their own political action committee. Um, members of Congress will try to raise money for each other, especially in very competitive districts. If they know someone's facing a tough re-election campaign, they'll try to raise money to help that person out. Um, neither party wants to lose the majority, so they're going to try and support candidates who can maybe help them retain the majority. It also matters what committee you get on. If you get the committee choice that you want, you're going to vote the way the leadership tells you to. Nancy Pelosi goes out of her way to make sure you're on the House Armed Services Committee. You're going to take direction from her. You're going to listen to her when she says, hey, I need you to do this. Um, it creates a sense of obligation of you owe me for this. I helped you, now you help me.
There's also pressure within Congress itself. Um, the leadership controls access to the floor. So if you really want to speak on a bill, you need to make sure that the leadership knows that you want time and that they're willing to give you access. Because again, not everyone can debate a bill. If you really, really want to speak up about it, you've got to convince the leadership. There's also, of course, the whip system. Uh, within the parties, they will make sure there's enough support for a vote. The whips will go to Nancy Pelosi and they'll say, we have enough support that we can move this forward. They'll go to Mitch McConnell and they'll say, this can come to the floor for a vote. You don't want a bill being introduced and it being vetoed or not being passed by the majority party. It makes the leadership look weak. So they've got to make sure there's enough support on the bill that it will pass or that it's damn near guaranteed that it will pass. There's also what they call log rolling. Um, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Um, you owe me this favor, now I'm calling it in. So they'll make this agreement that I'll support your bill if you support mine. A kind of odd example of this is what became known as the corn for corn exchange. Um, in the early 1990s, the National Endowment for the Arts brought a lot of flag for supporting artists and work that was seen as controversial and offensive. So Senator Jesse Helms wanted to cut off funding for the National Endowment of the Arts. So the supporters of the NEA went to senators from Western states and said, look, we know you don't care about the NEA. We know you care about the grazing fees of farmers and ranchers. How about we make a deal? You oppose defunding the NEA and will help eliminate this increased fee for um, cattle. And so that's what they did. They exchanged votes. Western senators got what they want. The NEA supporters got what they want. And pretty much everyone except Jess Helms won at the end of the day. You'll see that happening. Maybe one senator doesn't care much about an agriculture bill, but cares about foreign policy. They'll talk to each other and they'll say, if you support my bill, I'll support your bill, and we'll both win. There's a lot of that. Force trading, agreements, um, cooperation, calling in favors, all of that comes into play. There's also the role of the president. Uh, the more support the president has for the legislative agenda, the more loyalty the members are going to show the more likely the bill is going to get passed. For example, with the Affordable Care Act, President Obama made it very clear that he wanted this bill to be passed. The Democrats got in line and pretty much unanimously voted for the legislation. So if the president supports what the leadership is doing, the odds are that they're going to be able to um, get what they want done in Congress. Obviously, this doesn't work if we have one party controlling Congress and the other one controlling the presidency. Um, President Trump and Nancy Pelosi definitely aren't seeing eye to eye on legislation right now. It doesn't help that Congress has become more and more polarized and more and more inefficient. The 113th and 112th congressional sessions were the least 
productive in modern history. Not exactly something they should be proud of. Um, they really didn't have their act together. In 2013, it got so bad that only 9% of the public actually approved of the job Congress was doing. Uh, people got fed up, frustrated, annoyed, um, and they'd had enough. And part of it was because of the government shutdown in 2013. Republicans in the House said, we're not going to pass the funding bill to keep government open unless you delay the rollout of the Affordable Care Act. The Democrats said, this is legislation. We cannot delay it. It was passed. It has to come into effect. So the government shut down. Um, and eventually, the public said to congressional Republicans, get back to work and do your damn job. And so they gave in and the funding bill was passed. The same thing happened in 2018. President Trump wanted more funding for the border wall in the budget. Congress said no. The president said, fine, I'm not signing this bill. And the government was shut down for about a month. Government shutdowns are expensive. Um, basically, everything has to shut down. There's no uh, National Park Services people. No one in the Social Security office, uh, no one in Veterans Affairs. Basically, everyone is sent home. Um, and federal workers don't get paid during a shutdown. The only people who get paid are the military, except for the Coast Guard. So anyone who works in a government agency, um, TSA, um, Homeland Security, etc., they don't get paid during a government shutdown. Part of the problem we saw in 2018 was TSA workers stopped showing up. Like I, you expect me to come into work when I'm not getting paid. How can I afford childcare? How can I afford transportation? So they started calling in sick and trying to take other jobs so they could make ends meet. So LaGuardia Airport had to shut down a terminal. Miami had to shut down a terminal. Dallas had to shut down a terminal as people weren't showing up to work. The longer it went on, the less willing federal workers were to show up for no pay. Right? Why would you go to work if you're not going to get paid? Um, and it does have an impact on the economy. because They can't go out and spend money, and so the economy does take an inevitable hit. The problem with shutdowns is federal government workers don't get paid, but Congress still does. Congress doesn't necessarily feel an incentive to get back to work right away because they still get paid during a shutdown, which, quite frankly, I don't think they should be allowed to do. You shut down the government, you should not get paid for that. Um, but they do. So that's the problem with the government shutdown. We've also seen less bipartisanship. The majority party pass the legislation, the majority party passes the legislation. We don't see Congress members crossing the aisle to co-sponsor legislation. The minority party is basically told to sit down, shut up, and get out of the way. And it doesn't help that the Republican Party has become increasingly conservative. There used to be liberal and moderate Republicans within the party. A lot of them have been pushed out. Um, the Tea Party, for example, arguing that you can't be a real Republican unless you're a conservative can help matters, right? They were punishing moderates for being willing to work with each other. So it's harder for the party leaders to keep their members in line. And this happened to John Boehner. He was a moderate Republican was Speaker of the House, and he was willing to work with President Obama on legislation. He said, look, he's the President of the United States. We have to get things done. They kept getting pushback from conservatives. They wouldn't vote the way he wanted them to. They rebelled, and so finally he's like, I'm out of here. He stepped down as Speaker of the House, 
O'Brien became Speaker of the House, and he refused to work with the President, and everything went to hell in a handbasket. So it doesn't help that the party leadership can't get their members to stay in line. The minute they get party members who don't listen to them, the minute they're done. If you can't get your party to vote the way you need them to, you're out of a leadership position. That's just the end of the line for you. And it didn't help that the 2018 shutdown came during one of the busiest um, travel times for airports over the Christmas break, right? That that wasn't exactly great timing. Not that there's a good time to shut down the government, but holiday is definitely not a good time. Okay, um, Congress does have some oversight into the executive branch, including various agencies and cabinets. So they can try to control um, what agencies are doing. Um, are there issues with embezzlement, poor leadership, corruption, and so on? The various committees can subpoena witnesses and compel testimony. And if someone refuses to testify before Congress, they can be arrested for contempt. If they lie to Congress, they can face perjury charges. So if a witness is subpoenaed, they damn well better show up or they can be arrested. It's a really, really big deal. Um, lying to Congress can get you into some major trouble. So if Congress says, you better get here, you better get there, and you better not lie to them. Um, because they will file criminal charges against you. As dramatically, they're also in charge of the money for various agencies. Homeland Security will propose a budget. The EPA will propose a budget. Congress will look at that and say, yeah, this seems about right, or yeah, maybe cut down a little bit on your budget. Unfortunately, these investigations have become very, very partisan. Um, Congress spent a lot of time on the Benghazi investigation, hours of testimony from former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. And in the end, the end result was, could they have done a better job? Yes. Did they deliberately ignore what was happening in Benghazi? No. Um, so, a lot of investigation into things like the Clinton email server, but not enough on the abuses at Abu Ghraib prison. Abu Ghraib is a prison in Iraq. Uh, the U.S. military took it over after the invasion. And then photos and videos of American soldiers abusing prisoners, including things like um, Simulated drowning, electroshock, forcing them to perform sex acts on each other, and one where they had a detainee with a leash around his neck being dragged down the hallway. Um, Congress only spent 12 hours investigating this. The military actually did most of the investigating. It didn't help, right? You don't want to see images of US soldiers deliberately mistreating or abusing prisoners. Um, so that could have been more thoroughly investigated and was not. So constitutionally, the Senate has some powers that are not given to the House of Representatives. They have to approve the treaty, and they have to approve presidential appointments like the Supreme Court, federal judges, 
and the secretaries of the various cabinet positions. So that's a very important role that they have to fill. Unfortunately, we are seeing more use of the filibuster to try and block a judicial appointment. Now, there is an option that can be used that's called the nuclear option. This is where the Senate can say, we cannot filibuster a nominee for an executive branch or federal court position other than the Supreme Court. They do try to limit the amount of filibustering uh, so they can keep going. The treaties take forever to approve. Um, for example, in 1948, the United Nations created the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crime of Genocide. It was brought to the U.S. Senate, and they didn't ratify it until 1988. It took them 40 years to ratify a treaty that defined genocide and said we should do something about it. So, not like it was important, right? So presidents get frustrated with this. They're like, look, what is taking so long? Sometimes what they'll do to get around this logjam is to enter into an executive agreement. And this is where they make some kind of agreement with another country that has the power of a treaty but doesn't require Senate approval. Executive agreements are only enforceable as long as the president is in office. The minute they leave, the next person can rescind this agreement. But it's a way of getting around the Senate and getting things done, creating economic agreements, military agreements, and so on. It has the power of a treaty, but it's not permanent. It's a temporary agreement. An example of this was when we were cooperating with what was known as South Vietnam um, in the 50s and 60s prior to us actually going to war in Vietnam. So if the president needs to do something right away, needs to set up an economic agreement or a military agreement, and doesn't have the time to wait for the Senate to get on board, and he can enter into an executive agreement. Um, and as long as he's in office, he has the power of the treaty. Once he leaves, then the next person can be like, thank you very much, we're done. Also, only the Senate can use the filibuster. Uh, the House does not have the ability to filibuster. So, for example, if, President, if uh, former Vice President Biden does win next week, he'll have to nominate his entire cabinet, Secretary of Defense, Education, and so on, and all of them will have to be approved by the Senate. Usually, um, it's relatively straightforward. Sometimes they get controversial, like Betsy DeVos as um, Secretary of Education, but usually it's just a yeah, sure, whatever, we're done. Congress also has the power to impeach. This is where they can charge the president, a member of the cabinet, or a judge with treason, bribery, or what the Constitution calls other high crimes and misdemeanors. So it's a little vague um, only because. I mean, it could be something like corruption, lying to Congress, and so on. The way it works is that the House of Representatives essentially acts as the grand jury. They'll listen to expert testimony, 
but look at the evidence, and then they'll decide whether or not to impeach the president. So this is where the charges are filed against the president. So President Trump was impeached by the House. However, the Senate acts as the trial jury. They have to vote to convict. And you need a two-thirds majority vote in the Senate to convict and remove a government official. Only eight people have ever been convicted by the Senate. They were pretty much all federal judges who clearly broke the law. And we've had three presidents in history who have been impeached. Andrew Johnson in 1867. It was a very partisan kind of vote. It was during Reconstruction. Um, and he was saved from conviction by the Senate by one vote. So he came very close to being removed from office. Bill Clinton was impeached in 1998, lying under oath and obstructing justice because um, he lied about the affair with Monica Lewinsky. Well, obviously, it's not a crime to have an extramarital affair. Lying to Congress, that was a pretty dumb decision on his part. Uh, he should have just said, yes, I had a relationship with this woman. I'm very sorry. I now, you know, need some time with my family. Um, but because he lied, they could impeach him. Um, so he should have just told the truth. Or maybe kept it in his hands. But, but you know, just like, don't lie to Congress. Now, um, and so the House did impeach him. The Senate couldn't reach the two-thirds majority. And then, of course, President Trump, um, because of the allegations that he asked Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden's son, which was seen as an attempt at um, influencing an election, um, intimidation, and so on. The House impeached him, but the Senate did not convict. Um, impeachments aren't supposed to be highly partisan, but they can be. The only president who would have been removed from office would have been Richard Nixon. Um, when he realized he no longer had the support of his own party, he resigned rather than face impeachment and conviction, because he would have been removed from office. Um, it was pretty clear He'd broken the law, and so he would have been kicked out of office. So he said, I'll just wait before they can do that. If a president is impeached and convicted, um, the vice president takes over as the president, and the president um, could possibly face jail time, um, and in all likelihood can never run for political office again. Okay, so Congress today is seen as less effective and more partisan. The term do nothing Congress gets thrown around a lot. Um, they don't have high approval levels from the American people. We tend to look at Congress and say, why can't you just do your job? We don't pay you to sit there and do nothing. Why can't you figure this out? We're also seeing more government shutdowns because of this lack of bipartisanship. They don't have people crossing party lines to work together. So Republicans will say, we want this or else. Democrats will say, no, the government shuts down, or vice versa. So we're seeing more government shutdowns, and it's expensive. It costs us a lot of money to deal with a shutdown. Um, so it's hurting the economy on top of the fact that we don't have a functioning government. What do we do about it, right? How do we fix these problems? Well, one suggestion, of course, is 
instead of allowing for gerrymandering, instead of allowing the majority party in the state legislature to draw up the districts, let's have every state use an independent, nonpartisan commission that will draw up the districts based on geography, make the districts competitive. If you're facing a tough re-election, you may be more likely to be cooperative, to work with the other side. So that could solve part of the problem, right? Make it more competitive. Make it harder for someone to become permanently entrenched in Congress. Another suggestion that gets tossed around is eliminating the use of the filibuster in the Senate. This is unlikely for two reasons. One, it's in the Constitution, so we'd have to amend it. And two, good luck getting the Senate to agree to get rid of one of its special powers. It's just not likely to happen. So it's an idea, but it's not a very viable one. Another idea that gets tossed around is, why don't we make it so you have to have a bipartisan majority to pass legislation. The way it works now is whoever holds the majority of the seats passes the legislation. Um, so the minority party doesn't really get any say in it. How about we remove that? How about we say it can't just be a majority of Democrats. It has to be a majority of the members across the board. So you have to get Republicans on board in the House and Democrats on board in the Senate. You have to have bipartisan support to get legislation passed. Make them work with each other instead of against each other. Get rid of this whole, well, we have the majority, so screw you, policy in Congress. Make them actually have to work together. Uh, is it idealistic? Yeah but it certainly would fix some of the issues we see with Congress not doing their job. Okay, any questions? Okay, so the other suggestion that gets made, of course, is to put term limits on Congress. Um, so you guys online aren't going to be able to see what I'm writing on the board, but I'll discuss it. Um, so what would be the pros and cons of term limits? What would be an advantage of having term limits in Congress. What would be an advantage of having term limits in Congress? It's only allowing people to serve a certain amount of time. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. For minority representation, you get more women and minorities in Congress. Okay. Okay, faster. 
So if you know you only have 300 years of Congress, you're going to want to get here. Anything else? A little bit less corruption, right? Because interest groups can't hold on to someone for 15 or 20 years. What would you make this answer? them and they're always doing this. Um, so less voter choice, right? Because if you actually like your member of Congress, but they have term limits, then you can't get reelected. Also less experience. You lose that experience for people who've been on a congressional committee and then they have to start all over again. Else to go through this? No? Okay. Right. So keeping that in mind, the and the cons. Do you think that there should be term limits on Congress? Yeah. Two years is not long enough for the House of Representatives. I mean, how can you get anything done in two years? Ideally, I'd like to see if we did put into term, put in term limits four years for the House of Representatives and keep the six for the Senate, but give the people in the House longer. Because it's like, I just got elected, yay, now I have to start fundraising again. We still have enough time to work on legislation. Um, so I'd make it four years for the House and keep it six for the Senate, but put term limits in at that point. Also, I mean, I'm not trying to disparage people in their 80s. I know some people in their 80s were fairly active. Do we really need the majority of Congress to be over the age of 55? Part of that is if you're 84 and you're not facing a competitive election, you don't really have to campaign. Diane Feinstein didn't really have to campaign for office. She did have a primary opponent, but and she didn't really have to do any work, right? Because once they get that entrenched, if you don't have to fight for re-election, you can serve in Congress at 84. Like, you know, it's a problem. Um, that might help because I think Congress is a little too old. Uh, we, we could use some younger people in Congress, definitely. Yeah. Um, are you guys happy with the way our Congress works? Do you think this election will change anything? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, if Joe Biden becomes president and Democrats have control of the House and the Senate, then they'll be able to get quite a bit done. Um, if Biden becomes president, the Democrats only control the House and not the Senate, that will slow things down. Um, 
if Trump gets reelected, but Democrats take control of the House and the Senate, then that will also slow things down. Um, so there's a couple of different scenarios that could play out where we could actually have Congress going back to work and Congress slowing down even more than they already have, um, which really is not good, but there you go. My curiosity, would any of you consider running for Congress if there were actually term limits in place and you had a legitimate chance of winning? Yeah, I'd consider it at least, you know, wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, any of you have family members who are impacted by the shutdown in 2018? Anyone who had family members who lost jobs or money or anything? That's good. One class where I think one student, her mother worked for um, Border Patrol, and so he had to go to work and wasn't getting paid, and yeah, that sucks. Um, I think another congressional forum is if Congress shuts down the government, then Congress should not get paid. Like, if you're not doing your job, why are we paying you? Um, because it would, one, force them not to shut down as often, and two, if they do shut down, get in there and start negotiating. Because if federal workers aren't getting paid, then why the hell is Congress? Um, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, if you shut down the government, you should have to be the most to pay for it. I'm sorry? Um, yeah, see, I'm not entirely sure if that's in the Constitution or if that's just a congressional rule. If it's in the Constitution, we'd have to amend the Constitution. If it's just a policy of Congress, then they could hold a vote and they could choose to make that a law. Um, it might be more effective if it was a constitutional amendment because then it has more of a permanent status, but I would take even Congress temporarily having to live with the fact that they couldn't get paid for a shutdown. Um, I know in the Constitution, they can't increase their salary during an election year. Um, I don't know if it says that they still get paid during a shutdown. That might just be general policy. It would depend. It would depend. Um, there are some Democrats who have said that they would be on board with that. Uh, Ocasio-Cortez has said that she doesn't think Congress should get paid during a shutdown. Um, so if Democrats manage to take control the Senate and hold on to the House, it may be something they look at doing, putting that into effect. Um, I don't think they'd have a hard time getting Americans to say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? That would probably be a pretty popular piece of legislation. Yeah, I guess it's, that would be up to Congress, I think, but that's something that I think needs to happen. If you shut it down, you should have to pay for it. Any thoughts, questions? So Tuesday is the election. We're almost there. Um, I think we'll know who won next Tuesday night, but um, it's finally here, right? The finish line is in sight. We've survived so far but, uh, to election day. Um, interestingly enough, the, a lot of state governors are calling up the National Guard for election night. For Texas, they're going to be in the major cities. Um, honestly, I mean, I don't know if they're going to be needed because we may not know who won on election night. So I don't know what, you know, I don't know what would happen in that case. But a lot of states are calling up the National Guard because they think it's going to get ugly either way. Um, I don't know. I guess we'll have to see what happens on Tuesday. But we're almost there. Yay. Finally coming to an end. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, next week, we are going to talk about the presidency. So I have it scheduled for Thursday to talk about the election. However, if we don't know who won or it's still kind of up in the air, um, I'll do a discussion on the making of the modern presidency instead. Um, so we'll have to play that by ear. 
for Tuesday. Um, read chapter 13. Remember that your research paper is due on November 10th, which is a week from Tuesday by 11.59 p.m. in Blackboard. Any questions on the paper? No? Everyone's good? Okay. Um, if you haven't voted yet, make sure you vote. If you do anything for Halloween this weekend, be careful, be safe. Um, don't throw parties, guys. Please don't throw parties. Um, but have fun. Stay safe. Um, and I'll see you guys online on Tuesday and in person.